Welcome. I'm Bill Everett, and I'll be your host for this episode, Haydn and the String Quartet. When it comes to the history of European music, Joseph Haydn is undoubtedly one of its most significant and influential figures. Part of this has to do with his long and productive life. He was born in 1732, when the glories of the Baroque era were in full flower. This was a world where music was filled with decoration. Other musical characteristics of the time include a polarity between the top and bottom voices and lots of contrasts, between fast and slow, between long expansive melodies and fast-paced rhythmic energy, between soft and loud, between instruments and voices, between pieces for large public occasions and those intended for intimate private settings. Haydn lived through and in many ways defined the so-called classical period of the late 18th century, with its emphasis on finding balance between reason and emotion. Composers often look to the inherent processes of musical form in their works, from how small musical ideas called motifs would relate to one another on a micro level, all the way to large scale structural plans that underpin movements lasting as long as 10 minutes. When Haydn died in 1809, the Romantic era, with its inherent sense of yearning and expanding musical parameters, was well underway. Haydn also lived at a time when how one earned a living as a musician was changing. When he began his career, it was under a firm system of patronage. Haydn was employed by the wealthy Esterhazy family in Hungary, whose palace, Esterhaza, was built to rival Versailles in France. The Esterhazy princes loved music, and Haydn did whatever they wanted in this regard. He not only wrote music and played the violin, but also managed the instrument inventory and the orchestral personnel. He even was in charge of instrument repair. Until the death of Prince Nikolaus the Magnificent in 1790, Haydn lived at Esterhaza and had to ask the prince for permission to take on any outside activities. After the death of Nikolaus, Haydn moved to Vienna, a city becoming established as a major musical center, where in addition to receiving an annual stipend from the Esterhazys, he was able to accept commissions and thus become one of the first composers to earn his living by writing music. When it comes to musical genres, Haydn is credited with codifying the standard form and spirit of two of them, the string quartet and the symphony. The two genres, one for a specific group of instruments, a string quartet, and the other for orchestras of various sizes and instrumentations, grew up alongside one another. Both, thanks in no small part to Haydn, became standardized in four movement plans. First would be a fast movement, sometimes with a slow introduction, in which the composer showed creative prowess in handling musical materials. These tended to be the most serious movements of a work. Next came a slow movement, most often an expression of innate lyricism. Following this was a lively dance. Haydn favored the rustic Lindler, while Mozart preferred the courtly minuet. Sometimes the order of these inner movements was reversed, with the dance movement preceding the slow one. Jocular finales typically ended these works, bringing them to rousing conclusions. So, in effect, such four movement works, whether a symphony or a string quartet, began seriously, and their overall atmospheres gradually lightened through a slow movement and then a dance to end with delightful glee. Haydn wrote about 83 string quartets. This ensemble, consisting of two violins, a viola, and a cello, became and remains a quintessential chamber music grouping. Haydn's string quartets reside at the center of this particular ensemble's truly amazing repertory. The origins of the string quartet, though, are murky. Haydn may well have come across this scoring during his summers spent in Weinzil, a town in his native Austria. Here, as a young violinist, he played background music for parties with another violinist, a violist, and a cellist. Haydn wrote original music for this group to play, so there may be this practical dimension. But Haydn was not the first to write for this combination of instruments, for the four parts 
are also those of the standard four voice distribution going back centuries, soprano, alto, tenor, bass. The violins take the two upper parts, soprano and alto, the viola, the tenor, and the cello, the bass. I mentioned that Haydn wrote about 83 quartets. Why not an exact number? There are many reasons for this, including dubious authorship and what we decide to count as an original composition. Specifically, do we count works written for other groups of instruments that Haydn arranged for the string quartet as true string quartets? If one replies yes, then there are more Haydn string quartets than if one answers no. If we look at the first sets of quartets Haydn published, Opus 1 from 1764, Opus 2 from 1765, and Opus 3 from 1777, these questions become paramount. A brief diversion here. When we talk about opus numbers for composers, these refer to the order in which pieces were published. So, Opus 1 would typically be the first work of a composer to be published. It is also a convenient way to identify specific works, especially when you have 83 of them. Returning to Haydn, following the Baroque practice of assembling works in groups of six, often subdivided into two groups of three, each of these early publications includes six string quartets. Included in Haydn's Opus 1 are two works not by Haydn, but rather arrangements by Haydn of quartets for flute, violin, viola, and cello by Karl Josef Texi, a flute-playing composer who lived in Mannheim. In Opus 2, two of the quartets are arrangements of other works, but this time works by Haydn himself. And the Opus 3 quartets are not by Haydn at all, but rather by Romanus Hofstetter, a monk. This was a marketing ploy on the part of the publisher. If you wanted to buy a set of quartets, would you buy them written by a person you never heard of? Or quartets written by Josef Haydn, who worked for the esteemed Esterhazy family? See why it's better to say Haydn wrote about 83 string quartets without giving a specific number? It does get clearer once Haydn becomes a more established musical presence, though publishers still sometimes put Haydn's name on pieces he didn't write in order to sell copies and make more money. Broadly speaking, these early quartets exhibit the idea of polarity associated with the Baroque. The top part, the first violin, and the bottom part, the cello, are of prime importance, and the middle voices are generally filler material. In fact, one could play some of these works without either the second violin or the viola, hence creating a string trio, and they'd work just fine. It is with the Opus 20 set, written in 1772, that all this changes. Now, Haydn makes all four members of the ensemble essential. The quartet becomes a single entity with four recognizable and essential components. It's sort of like a four-leaf clover, though certainly not as rare. And the roles that the various instruments can play also expands. The cello can take the melody and the viola the bass line. We now have four individuals capable of engaging in sublime musical conversations. One way in which Haydn could show this essentiality of all four instruments was to create fugues. He evoked that highly scientific process associated with the Baroque, whereby each voice enters one after the other with the same melody, and a dense, translucent texture is created in which every note of every voice can be heard. It's like a sonic puzzle, where every piece must fit together perfectly, or else it all comes tumbling down. Sometimes fugue melodies, or subjects, have a counter-subject, musical material that complements the main theme. Haydn crafts magnificent fugues for the last movements of three of the quartets in his Opus 20 set. Let's listen to the opening of the last movement of the final quartet in the set, number six. We'll hear an active fugue subject with lots of melodic skips, which is joined by a slightly more sustained scalar descending counter melody. Notice how Haydn likes to pair instruments together, one playing the subject, another the counter subject. Keep this in mind, for Haydn will continue to employ this kind of pairing throughout his string quartets. Here's the fugal opening with counter subjects.
Haydn maintains this vibrant contrapuntal texture throughout the movement with voices interacting with other voices in a complex web of sound. Well, almost. Let's listen to the end of the movement. After all this complex counterpoint, this intertwining of four independent parts, Haydn makes the quartet play the subject in unison. This is fiendishly difficult. Unison playing, singing, or speaking is difficult at the best of times, and with only four people, it's especially treacherous. It is all too apparent who isn't fitting in and matching. The players must switch their modes of listening from a textured fabric to a solitary, unified purpose. But this is Haydn, and it is part of what makes Haydn, Haydn. Although these Opus 20 quartets reflect an independence of four essential parts, Haydn waited until he published another set of quartets in 1781 as Opus 33 to publicly acknowledge what he already was doing. He remarked that these quartets were conceived in, quote, an entirely new and particular manner." End quote. By this, he meant not only an essential four-part texture, but also a melodic structure in which phrases would be balanced in terms of harmonic motion and length. Here, melody refers to the horizontal presentation of pitches, while harmony looks largely to its vertical aspects, notes that support the melody. Haydn often gives us a question, followed with an answer. We move to something that needs completion. The underlying harmonic structure implies this. And then Haydn completes it.
With these Opus 33 quartets, Haydn in many ways ensured the future of the genre. The four movement plan was now solidified as the norm and other composers, including Mozart, began writing for this particular ensemble. Important people took note. King Friedrich Wilhelm II of Prussia, for example, was a fine cellist and often commissioned composers to write chamber works for he himself to play. Haydn obliged with his set of quartets, published as Opus 50 in 1787. These were nicknamed the Prussian Quartets because of their royal dedicatee. As one would expect with a set of quartets dedicated to a fine cellist, the cello has some wonderful passages in these works. Haydn made two lengthy visits to London in the 1790s, the first in 1791 and 1792, and the second in 1794 and 1795. It was for this latter stay that Haydn created six quartets that he dedicated to his friend, the Hungarian Count Anton Aponyi. The impresario, or manager, responsible for Haydn's London visits was the violinist Johann Peter Salomon. Salomon had arranged for Haydn's new quartets to be heard not in a private salon, as was the case for the works Haydn wrote for the Esterhazys, but rather in a public concert hall. These concert halls were obviously larger than rooms in a palace, and hence the acoustics would be very different. Haydn wrote these new quartets with this concert hall acoustic in mind. We can hear this in the first quartet of the Opus 71 set. Chords voice over a huge range are separated with space, that is, silence, that allows them to resonate in the larger venue. Haydn spent the latter part of his life in Vienna. He was free to accept commissions, including one from the Hungarian Count Josef Erdödi, to write a series of six string quartets. Haydn obliged, and the result, published as Opus 76, are considered the crown jewels of Haydn's string quartet writing. The noted writer Charles Burney, in his A General History of Music, called them, quote, full of invention, fire, good taste, and new effects." Quote. In 1799, the music-loving Bohemian prince Josef Franz Lobkowitz commissioned a set of six quartets from Haydn. 
This is the same Lobkowitz who was a great patron of Beethoven. Due to ill health, Haydn only completed two of the projected set, which were published as his Opus 77. These were the last complete quartets Haydn wrote. He did complete the middle movements of an unfinished quartet in D minor in 1803, which was published after his death as Opus 103. To conclude this episode, we'll hear the first movement of the fourth quartet in the majestic Opus 76 set, nicknamed Sunrise. Note the opening, which some listeners thought reminded them of a sunrise, hence the nickname. The movement is typical Haydn, with musical ideas tossed from instrument to instrument to instrument. Remember how way back in the last movements of some of his Opus 20 quartets, he wrote fugues that included not just a subject, but also a counter subject, thus creating duets within the quartet? The same textures are evident here, many years later. The four instruments often appear as two simultaneous duets, the two violins playing a duet, while the viola and the cello do the same. The pairs can switch around. For example, the second violin and the viola, the cello and the second violin, and so forth. And listen for this balanced musical structure. Segments that have an open ending, followed by ones that provide closure. Here's the aerial string quartet to play the first movement of Haydn's string quartet, Opus 76, number four, The Sunrise.
Thank you for joining us for Haydn and the String Quartet. We hope you'll join us for other episodes in this series. Farewell, or as I say in Austria, tschüss. Thank you.